Welcome and good morning. Thank you for joining us for Shree's Sunday New York Times read along, hashtag NYT read along. Our guest today is Cornelia Dean, former science editor of the New York Times. We'll also be joined by Dr. Geeta Nair, Chief Medical Officer for Greenway. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan. You can watch us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Please let us know where you're watching from and share, like, comment, and tag your friends so they can join us for this great conversation. We have an incredible show planned for today, really courtesy of the New York Times. If you haven't seen their front page, it's uh, incredible, and we'll be getting to it shortly. Uh, before we do that, though, we will uh, bring in uh, our host, Sri Srinivasan. Uh, Sri uh, is joining us from New York and showing us his uh, balcony shot. Um, that is uh, downtown with the Hudson River on the right-hand side, right, Sri? Yep, there you go. There's New Jersey, and over here is Midtown Manhattan. We're on the Upper West Side, and if you look down, you see how empty New York is. That's a subway stop right there, and for the 96th Street subway stop to be so empty, even on a Sunday morning, is shocking for people and uh, something that we're just getting used to. We're on day 74 of the lockdown in New York City, Neil. Day 74, which is incredible. Um, and uh, you know, we have so many uh, people joining us. Laura Silverman, uh, who's uh, usually with us from Philadelphia. Jonathan Borstein, of course, from uh, uh, Union Square. Uh, Rochelle Philippeck, uh, my neighbor uh, from Hastings on Hudson, where I used to live, where my mom still lives. Thank you, Rochelle. Nidhi Sinha is, uh, is joining us. Uh, sorry, uh, Rusadan is joining us as well. Uh, Nidhi Sinha is joining us um, from uh, South Orange, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, there's my mom as well, joining from Hastings on Hudson. Hi, mom. Always great to see you. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, Diane Stefani joining us from Margate, uh, New Jersey. Um, so we always have a great uh, uh, turnout for this show, for this weekly show, and, and this week is no different. Um, and as more people are commenting and bringing in, uh, Sri, what I'd like to do is to bring in our production team uh, to introduce them to uh, our viewers uh, so people know what we're doing and how we're doing the show. Uh, so Paula Kiger, and we have uh, Steve Taylor, Julia Weeks, and officially part of the production team, Carla Baranakis uh, joining us. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, our producers. Uh, we could not do this show without you. Um, the way that we manage this, I am managing the show through StreamYard uh, in the, uh, the background as the executive producer. But to make this community work and make this New York Times Read Along family work, uh, Paula Kiger is sitting in the Facebook page, in Shree's Facebook page, engaging with the audience, sharing links, annotating the conversation, if you will. Uh, Steve Taylor is doing the same in LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, new this week, we can actually get the comments from LinkedIn automatically uh, into StreamYard. So that will be a great uh, uh, benefit, make it a lot easier. Um, and uh, Julia Weeks, who has been our backup producer, filling in uh, as necessary, uh, has taken on a new role of coordinating our medical segment every week. So we have uh, Dr. Nair is going to be joining us uh, at 10 o'clock. Uh, and I want to recognize Carla Baranakis as well. Uh, Carla is a great friend of the show and uh, has uh, done a great job uh, introducing us to several guests, helping to coordinate uh, a, a list guests like today's guest, Cornelia Dean, former science editor of the New York Times, Harlan Coben, uh, the author. Uh, we had Mickey Maynard, uh, former Detroit bureau chief for the New York Times, uh, and uh, many, many other guests. Over and that's just, that's just these last few uh, few weeks with- Just uh, the last Carla, few weeks. Carla, Carla's, exactly. Carla's former, former national copy chief of the New York Times, and this should be uh, right into the New York Times alumni group, I believe. She's always great at uh, getting the word out as well. So we're very grateful to Carla for everything she's done for this show and to help us over five years as we have 
brought you this New York Times read along. It's not just about celebrating print or the New York Times. It's about people who care about the news and how to pay attention to it, about facts in the middle of everything else that's going on. Absolutely. So, uh, Carla, thank you for all that you do. Uh, and Carla uh, has a newsletter called The Local Connection out of uh, uh, Montclair. Um, it's Montclair State, right, uh, Carla? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it's a great resource for journalists. So thank you to all of our producers. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to them and they'll keep us abreast of any uh, issues that are coming up, anything we need to monitor on the uh, production. Shri? I'll just tell everyone that folks know that I do a daily program around COVID-19 that we produce without this kind of team. We have people who help me book the shows and also to uh, do the live tweeting and things like that. But this you're seeing here, the production team that does our virtual events and also creates these kind of shows for individuals, organizations, etc. So if you would like to hire us to take your physical event virtual or to build your own show for you, please let us know. Email me, sri at sri.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E.net. Thank you everybody for being here. Great to see you, and we'll see you again uh, when we do our debrief later. Absolutely. Sounds good. Thank you, uh, and we'll uh, see you uh, see you later. Uh, so goodbye to Paula and Steve and Julia uh, and Carla. Uh, so Shri, before we uh, proceed, uh, we we should pay some bills, right? Um, we have yes. some great sponsors that we want to recognize. Uh, so go ahead. Um, we'll we'll start off with Muckrack. Uh, you're doing some interesting work with them, correct? Yes, I am very excited to say that I've joined Muckrack as an advisor, and Muckrack Academy is their new fundamentals of social media for journalists, PR pros, and everyone. It's a new course. starts in June. It's a certification course, and we believe that this is one of the best ways that you can upskill yourselves. Uh, during this pandemic. It's about a two hour course all, uh, on demand that you can take starting in early June, but sign up today. Go to mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. It's a free certification program that'll teach you the basics of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And we believe that this was, is a great way to uh, help people in this time of crisis. 34 million Americans out of work and uh, all of us, including me, can benefit from a refresher or a look, new fresh look at what's happening on social media. So please go to mrac.co slash social, invite your kids, invite your friends, anybody in the world. More than 3,000 people have signed up in one week already. And so please uh, join us. And thank you to our friends at Muckrack for making that possible. And a big shout out to Linda Bernstein, my colleague, who's working very hard to put together the course right now. You can sign up now and take the course in early June. Absolutely. Uh, we also want to recognize Magic Bus USA, another one of our sponsors. Um, Magic Bus imagines a world where children break out of poverty and lead fulfilling, rewarding lives, contributing to their community and to the world around them. Uh, as you can see, seven, seven out of 10 adolescents in India do not have a higher secondary qualification. Six out of 10 youth do not have the soft skills necessary for employment. And three out of 10 girls are married before they reach 18 years. Uh, so thank you to Magic Bus uh, for your support. Uh, and in addition to Muckrack and Magic Bus, we also want to recognize Strategy Focus Group. Uh, Strategy Focus Group is a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. Thank you to Magic Bus USA, our friend Pradnya Haldipur, uh, and uh, for Muckrack, uh, Greg Gallant and Mike Schneider, and Ron Thomas from Strategy Focus Group for your support of the New York Times read along. Uh, we certainly want to encourage people to learn more about the work uh, of our sponsors. Uh, so you can follow, uh, learn more at these links, readalong.link slash muckrack, readalong.link slash magicbususa, or readalong.link strategy focus group. If you are interested in being a sponsor of the New York Times Read Along, please contact 
Sri Srinivasan, Sri at Sri.net, or myself, Neil Parekh. My email address is neil at neilparekh.org. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. So, Neil, I think we're ready to get started. Absolutely. So why don't we introduce you to our guest for today. Uh, Cornelia Dean is the former science editor of the New York Times, and Dr. Geeta Nair is our medical expert who will be joining us later in the program. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, Corey Dean, is uh, you're out in Chappaquiddick, uh, correct? I'm headed there today, but the minute I'm in Providence, Rhode Island. In Providence. Uh, and, and Dr. Nair, where are you based? I'm in uh, sunny Miami, Florida. It's a little rainy today, but but usually sunny. <laughs> sunny, I think it's uh, cloudy in a lot of places today. Um, so we'll be uh, focusing uh, on the New York Times uh, first with uh, Cornelia Dean, and then uh, we'll get to our conversation. Uh, as folks know, uh, we bring in a medical expert uh, at about 10 o'clock Eastern time, uh, about an hour and 15 minutes from now, uh, to answer your questions about COVID-19. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, uh, think of them, keep them uh, in your back pocket and share them uh, closer uh, to when Dr. Nair joins us. Uh, so Dr. Nair, thank you again for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, but you, you prefer to be called Dr. G, correct? Is that um, your moniker? You know, a, a lot of patients have a hard time with, with, with Geetha Nair. Maybe not you, Shri and Neil, but... But Dr. G just tends to be a lot easier. It's also a lot easier to spell. So thank you for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. Couldn't be a more important topic. You saw the front cover this morning. I mean, just, just humbling times. So science matter. I, I applaud all your efforts. Cornelia, big fan. So again, thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll, we'll have Dr. G join us in a little bit. Thank you. Uh, with that, Shri, uh, let's dive into uh, today's discussion. So much to talk about this week. Uh, not just in terms of the paper and, and this incredible cover that we've referenced a few times, but uh, the role of science in journalism and the science in our society today as we're dealing with COVID-19. Uh, so I will step out and, and leave you to the conversation. And there are a couple of comments that I'm going to share on the screen before, uh, after I leave, uh, just acknowledging what a great team that we have. So I want to make sure we uh, put those on the screen as you start talking with uh, Corey. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil, and thank you for what, what, what has been a wonderful two and a half year partnership on the read along. You took what was a fun, informal uh, project and made it into a fun, big project. And we are so grateful to you for being our executive producer for all these years. And uh, big greeting to our friend Corey Dean. Corey, I have in my hands your book, Making Sense of Science. And this is about separating substance from spin. And this is your book. We want everybody who's watching to go to Amazon or their favorite independent book site and get this book because this is what you need to arm yourself until the vaccine comes along. Arm yourself with information, correct information, and how to learn how to fight the pandemic of in bad information that we're seeing all over the internet. So Corey, thank you for writing this book. And thank you for sharing this with us. And thank you for being here this morning. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I did not realize at the time how particularly apropos the book was going to turn out to be. I knew there were a lot of issues that people were being misled about. And I was in hopes of offering some helpful advice on how to navigate your way through this landscape of claims and counterclaims and so on. But um, I have to say it is particularly apt uh, when we hear what, what we're hearing in this pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Folks, everyone who's watching, please hit share right now. There's someone in your life who would benefit from hearing Corey Dean talk about the news, former science editor of the New York Times and author of Making Sense of Science. Please tag them, please hit share. Just tag them in the comments or please hit retweet. We're live on Facebook, on YouTube, on LinkedIn and uh, and on Twitter. So please tag and share this right now. We want everybody to be able to benefit from this conversation. And so let's get started and uh, we'll come back to this book. We'll mention it multiple times because we want everybody to be able to see that. 
Um, and I want to start by just asking Corey how you're doing, how's your family, and all that's going on. Um, I'm fine. I'm more than fine. And the people in my family, circle of family and friends are all fine. Oh, we are all able to work at home. None of us has suffered an interruption in our income. And um, I don't, some of us, I think, might have actually got the virus, including possibly me, but nobody became seriously ill. Um, that separates all of us from a large, large number of our fellow Americans, many of us whose names appear in the amazing cover of the paper today. Um, and it's it, it's easy when you're when you're in this kind of a sheltered situation to start complaining about the, your inability to go out to dinner or something. But um, it's important not to lose sight of the families and children in particular who are really suffering um, because of this lockdown and so on. Thank you, Corey, and everyone. Please tell us where you're watching from. Tell us how your family is doing and. Uh, please make sure you ask questions as well that we will go to Corey for. So first thing we're gonna do is look at the New York Times, uh, just kind of spread out on the table here. Uh, Corey, when you see this uh, spread, uh, we also, by the way, just brought in the Wall Street Journal from the, the weekend edition so that people can see how this is being covered there as well. Our focus is print and uh, the print editions of, of uh, newspapers. Corey, what is your first thought as you look at this array? Oh, I love print. Um, so I'm glad to see that it's still here. I suppose it's doomed, but I hope not because I really think it's a, in many ways um, a, a superior way to read the paper, especially as a science journalist, I feel this because a lot of Americans are afraid of science or they their only experience, their last experience with it was in high school where they were alternately bored or terrified. And so people don't seek it out necessarily online the way they seek out other things. And the great thing about print is you, you have serendipity. You don't know from one day to the next what you're gonna discover in a print publication. And that I think leads people to, to reading about science, which I think is, you know, obviously really good. I'm a science journalist, so. And not just any science journalist, former science editor of the New York Times. And this is the most important headline, I think, of this entire season. No one knows what's going to happen. And that's the cover of the Sunday Review. Sunday business in a fanfic few deep and kinky questions emerge. So they found time to talk about other things on the business section. This is that at home section that uh, I think is so uh, useful at this moment. We're really, really trying to get out of the chair. It also has the uh, five dishes to cook. And this uh, weekend, uh, this past week, I cooked the Korean meatball recipe, which we did both vegetarian and non-vegetarian editions. The book review is open and shut. Once in Mighty Terrible Tide, the epic struggles of American immigration and the deportation machine, America's long history of expelling immigrants and the New York Times Magazine, what we've learned in quarantine. Can Coney Island survive this is the cover of Metropolitan. And just tell the truth, Spike Lee, who has a new movie, talks about race, the virus, the president, and history. And there's a real estate section, the backyard amusement park. Homeowners are investing in ways to survive, to save this summer from the pandemic. But the most important thing to talk about, of course, is this stunning, stunning New York Times front page. The U.S. deaths, U.S. deaths near 100,000, an incalculable loss. They were not simply names on a list. They were us. Numbers alone cannot possibly measure the impact of the coronavirus on America, whether it's the number of patients treated, jobs interrupted, or lives cut short. As a country grim nears a grim milestone of 100,000 deaths attributed to the virus, the New York Times scoured obituaries and death notices of the victims. The thousand people here reflect just 1% of the toll. None were mere numbers. Absolutely stunning. Among other things, this reminds me of what the pages used to look like 100 years ago. The New York Times, you know, there was no art and it was these long columns like this. And the pain that this represents is 
hard to even fathom, and this is just 1,000 of 100,000 names. Your thoughts, Corey Dean? Well, it's immensely powerful. Um, and of course, what you say is right, it's 1%. It represents 1% of the people who have already died. If you, we would have to have, uh, you know, 100 more of this to um, get the real total. I, I, my question um, is whether it's so powerful that it will be interpreted as a political statement. And I hope it isn't. But um, but it might be. Yeah, and that's where also I think one of the things that we all have to think about as we look at the news and understand the role of journalism, but the fact that merely printing this uh, can be interpreted as political tells you the, the terrible state we're in today. Uh, those of you who are subscribers to my newsletter at about 8 a.m. this morning, but half an hour ago, you got in your mailbox my latest newsletter, and it leads with this picture and uh, and talks about uh, President Trump and how he has approached the virus. And among other things, uh, my headline is that President Trump has a very good chance of being elected in November. So we're not going to get into that in this show. But if you aren't a subscriber of my uh, newsletter, we write it every Sunday, please email me sri at sri.net and I'll add you to the mailing list. It's, uh, we have thousands of people who read it every Sunday and I'm very grateful for the feedback and the con conversation we have there. I just want to show you that one of my friends is here, Floyd Cardo is 59 of Montclair, New Jersey, Indian chef of fine dining. Many of you know him from uh, how the New York Times put him on the map with Ruth Reichel's multiple reviews in the New York Times back in the late 90s of Tabla, one of the restaurants run by Danny Meyer that put Floyd on the map and he died uh, at the very beginning of this crisis. So let's move on. Any other thoughts, Corey? I just want to say Alan Finder, one of our um, New York Times colleagues is also on that list. Yeah, he and very, yeah. Of the virus. yeah, very, very sad and painful to see this. All right, we're going to uh, keep going. Please, folks, share your thoughts uh, and please connect with us and tag your friends as we read the New York Times on Sunday morning. Reckoning with loss, reckoning loss with names. There are no articles or photographs on today's front page, only stories. And this is an explanation of how they put this together. And I wanted to say that uh, a big shout out to our friend Tom Jolly, who's a print editor of the New York Times, whose, whose team has been doing fantastic work in the middle of this crisis to make print even more influential and powerful than ever. And Tom brought us into his home uh, in July 2019. Neil and I went to read the New York Times at his home with him, and he's going to join us again on June 21st. So. Uh, please uh, stand by for that. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing that remotely. We will not be going to his home, but he's going to help us read the New York Times and take your questions on June 21st. Israel seizes Nazi chief of... Can I stop you for one second? Please. I, I, I just want to say that um, this, and this project reminds me and probably will remind a lot of people of the uh, portraits of grief that the Times did after 9-11, the little thumbnail portraits of everybody who died in the attacks. And this kind of a project, to actually do this kind of work, is wrenching for the people who do the work. It's, it's very sad. And um, so I really have to say thank you to everybody who managed to stick with it and do it. It's not it's not only just not technically easy, but it's emotionally, uh, it's wrenching to immerse yourself in something like this. So, yes, so thank you to, to those people who made that work. Yeah, thank you uh, for acknowledging that. And we are going to keep looking at the paper and I'm gonna read some of the comments that have been coming in. We're just, I'm looking at my laptop while talking to you here so that I can see some of the comments uh, that have come in as well. 
uh, as we as we talk about this. So many people watching from around the world. Thank you for being here. Please tag and share with your friends right now. Sujana says, just found names of people I know on the front page. So sad. Dr. Chandrasekhar was with us multiple times during this era. Claudia Dreyfus, former guest on the show just a couple of weeks ago, says hello to Corey Dean from Claudia and Andrew Hacker in New York City. And Andrew was also a guest on our show just a couple of weeks ago, uh, author of a big new book on President Trump. Yeah. And Laura says the cover is shocking, heartbreaking, and enraging. It did not have to unfold this way. And we've always felt that, Corey, uh, that things were going wrong, how America, allegedly the greatest country on earth in so many ways, uh, the richest country on earth certainly uh, was having the worst outcomes of all the countries. And now there has been a study from Columbia University that said if things had been shut down just one week earlier, 36,000 lives could have been saved. So I think, you know, when you compare uh, country to country, it's we have no idea what's going on with this pandemic because we don't have good testing. And it's not just us. Lots and lots of places don't have good testing. So to make comparisons like that is, I don't know, I would say kind of pointless at this point. But um, um, but there isn't any question that these techniques that we have adopted are effective. And that if we had adopted them earlier, um, we would have saved a lot of lives. It was um, really um, encouraging to me to hear Governor Cuomo say that they have tested the frontline people like uh, sanitation workers and um, first responders, EMTs, nurses, doctors, people who are out in the world and find that the people who are maintaining the PPE, you know, the masks and so on, their actual rate of infection is lower than the general population in their area. And so that tells you that this stuff works. But um, it has people have to do it so well of course and now it's all <laughs> being opened up ahead of schedule ahead of the guidelines made by his own government president trump is encouraging people to break his own guidelines and that's where we are uh folks uh please keep sharing your thoughts uh we're looking now at on this day in history this was the day that israel seized the nazi chief of extermination of jews on may 24th 1960 when they captured Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi war criminal. And that, that this was the subject of multiple movies. That's how many people know about this uh, story uh, today. And one of the things I keep telling everyone who joins me on my shows is mark this moment, you know, uh, keep track of what you are experiencing, journal, uh, take photos, things like that, because you will want to remember where you were and how things unfolded during these days. I love this, uh, a, a little item from the parenting newsletter. Whitney Two of San Francisco says, I taped an old shoelace across my door frame and draped random scarves on it. My 18 month old just ran in and out of the scarf curtain for 15 minutes. I sat by myself in the room next door. It was great. And that tells you something that you don't always need technology to be able to occupy your kids in the middle of this. Tracking an outbreak, will this crisis cement Americans' lack of faith in Washington? Yes, it will. And I don't know how much faith there was in the first place. Guiding her team of five million out of lockdown, this oh, is a heroic story. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It might, but it might not. We have to hope it might not. Andrew Hacker's book that you just mentioned, uh, Downfall, the very interesting analysis of actual voting, not polls, not pe what people tell the media, whatever, but how they actually vote. And if you look at how they actually vote, um, if you, uh, you can get a different picture, let me put it that way. You can get a different idea of what might unfold in November. He says that voting, um, there's a lot more support for Democrats than for Republicans if you look at how people actually vote. So yes, 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 he is. He's been very clear about that, and he's staked his, uh, you know, his book on it. And we want to tell folks that you can see the archives of all our New York Times read-alongs and all my shows by going to YouTube.com/slash Srinet S R E E N E T. 
and you can search the archives and please subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can take a look at everything that's there, including the interview last week with Rick Wilson of, uh, of uh, Florida fame, who is a Republican, but now a very strong anti-Trumper and also Andrew Hacker and Claudia Dreyfus's interview. So you can see those as well. No, and here is Jacinda. People, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you, Sri. Um, but when people get the idea that a situation is hopeless, they lose hope. And that leads to inaction. And uh, if there was ever a time that there needs to be action, not just on the disease, but on climate, on so many other issues, this is that time. So it's important for us not to lose, not to lose hope. And not I, to trust I agree. I agree. I will just say that uh, I think the other thing that leads, leads to complacency is also overconfidence. And that's what happened in 2016, where people presumed there was no way Trump could win, including people like me. And we saw where we ended up that way. So I, I agree with you about what the possibilities are. I was one of the few people I know who thought that Trump might win. Um, and people laughed at me for it. And he didn't actually win. He did not win the popular vote, but um, he won the election. So, But that doesn't matter, right? The, the only thing that matters is the electoral college. Exactly. And so uh, there is no, there are no moral victories in this. Guiding her team of 5 million out of lockdown, this is Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand. And she's been kind of hero in this, hasn't she? Yes, yes. She's very... Um, She's amazingly popular in uh, New Zealand. I have friends who live there, and they, uh, even though they might not like absolutely everything that she's ever done, they are. She's very popular. But th this article was interesting to me because it talks about how um, their election process is different in New Zealand than ours is here. And we are like really focused on winner take all, and they are not. And the upshot of it is that they have more coalition governments. And the upshot of that is that people have to learn to work together across the aisle, as we would say in this country. And that seems to be uh, helpful. So I would say read that article and see what you think. It would be interesting to see what would happen here if we changed that winner take all approach to our politics. Maybe Andrew can make that his next book. <laughs> Claudia asks a question. Because of the pandemic, science news has jumped to the front page of every remaining newspaper in the country. Corey, do you think some is too fast, too sensational, perhaps too hopeful? Would you, for instance, have run a story on a phase one vaccine trial that was tested on seven or eight people? Ordinarily, no. Um, but these are not ordinary times. Um, I don't know what to say about that. I, that has I mean, it moved the market. And um, we'll have to see how it plays out. But um, science, writing about science, if you're, a, if you're a lay language journalist like Claudia and I are, um, is just difficult. It's, you don't necessarily have the chops to navigate every question that you're going to be confronted as a, as a writer. I don't know what I would have done with that study. I do not believe it could have been kept out of the paper because it was it it um, was providing an answer to a lot of questions. Does uh, does exposure to the virus actually cause you to develop antibodies? If you have the antibodies, do they do you any good? And those are really important questions going forward. I would say in a way that that study is a question, not an answer. That study raises the question, is it possible that this, these phenomena might be replicatable on a larger scale? That's a really good question we don't know the answer to yet. We'll find out when we have um, larger tests. But I think the only way to speed up the process of getting to a vaccine is to shorten the time of testing and the size of testing. And that is the kind of thing that can lead you to have unexpected consequences at the end of the day, as happened with the salt vaccine originally. Some children, given that original version of that vaccine, actually got polio from it. 
So, you know, I considered it hopeful and I was glad to read about it. But ordinarily we would not, a study with eight people in it, no. That's not something you would bet the mortgage on, journalistic. Yeah, uh, a, a question for you about the vaccine. One of the problems, even since the SALT days, has been that America has become much more skeptical of science, in, especially when it comes to vaccines, thanks to people like candidate Trump, then President Trump, but also Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Jenny McCarthy and all of these people. So even if we do get a miraculous vaccine, don't we need something like 80% of people to take it to be effective? Well, the anti-vaxxers get a lot of press. Um, it's rare to encounter a group of people that you can say with a straight face are completely out to lunch on this subject. There is absolutely no reason for anything that they say, as far as I can tell. Vaccination is the greatest public health boon since plumbing. So um, it's, you know, it's absurd to talk about it as a threat. It's absolutely noxious. Um, but we focus on them and we neglect to notice that 97 or 98 percent of parents are vaccinating their children. I doubt if that number is going to fall for ideological reasons. It may fall because people are afraid to go to the doctor or the doctor is only seeing COVID patients or whatever. Now, a lot of people are not getting the ordinary health care that they would ordinarily get now just because the situation is different. But um, our country generally supports vaccination as it should. Um, so I, you know, I don't worry about that particularly. If we get an effective vaccine, my guess is people will be lining up in their masks to get it. So that would be my prediction. All right, I love how hopeful you are and thank you for that. Well, I need that in part because I host a weekly call-in radio show here in New York on WBAI-FM and on Saturdays from noon to two. And every time we have a medical guest on, people call in from the extreme right and extreme left saying they will not take the vaccine, blaming Bill Gates and all kinds of horrible conspiracies. So I'm hoping that those are just the noisy uh, folks and we hope you're right. Here's a comment from Tom Jolly via email from Carla. I just add that ultimately Dean Baquet deserves enormous credit for being open to bold ideas and new ways of expressing data as we've repeatedly done on the front page throughout the pandemic. Absolutely right. Yeah, uh, let's keep, let's look at some of the other comments that came in. I saw that Pradnya Haldipur had commented earlier that uh, these are excellent insights from Corey and Pradnya is a former guest of this show. Uh, so thanks Pradnya for watching this morning and always supporting our show. I want to ask you, Corey, what are the things we could learn in your excellent book, Making Sense of Science, uh, how to separate substance from spin? And uh, tell us about this unusual cover, too. Well, you know, co covers are the hardest thing about doing a book. That is, do you know what it is? Uh, that's a walnut. Yeah, it's the three-card Monty game that people play on the street. Sometimes with cards, you hide the peak. I don't, I'm not crazy about the cover because too many people are confused by it. So just try to ignore the uh, walnut shells. Um, uh, what the book is trying to do is um, help people who want to understand the, it, the science and technical issues that confront us today. And many of them are really important and really complex. And many of them raise questions that, in my opinion, should not be answered by a self-selected bunch of intellectuals in a windowless room somewhere. For example, um, the new uh, CRISPR genetic engineering techniques, the, one of the women who developed that, Jennifer Doudna, I heard her say once that these, uh, these techniques are so cheap and so simple that they could be carried out in a reasonably well-equipped high school biology lab. This is technology that even Jennifer Doudna and her colleagues say should not be let loose on the world without some kind of a wider social conversation about do we want this or not? How do we want to deal with it, et cetera? 
that's the kind of conversation on that issue and on a whole raft of other issues that we're not having because a lot of people have difficulty with the subject matter. So my uh, goal with the book was to offer people information that will help them when they're confronted with these kind of questions um, to make up their own minds. And so a lot of it is, well, how do you know if somebody is an expert? How, what do we know about models? There's been a lot of talk about models in the context of the pandemic. Modeling is highly imperfect. And it's models, as I say in the book, are they are very vulnerable to being torqued by somebody who wants to produce a particular outcome. So the book offers some information on, all right, if someone's doing something based on a model, what do you want to know about the model before you decide whether or not you want to trust the, uh, the outcome? Um, who is an expert? Lots of people have credentials that sound impressive, but they don't necessarily relate to whatever the topic at hand is. So the book talks about that kind of thing. Um, but just generally, um, there's a lot of stuff in the book about medicine and how to know whether a treatment is good or bad, how to know whether testing is useful or not useful. Quite a lot of medical testing is not just not useful, it's actually, at the end of the day, unhelpful. It can be hurtful. So the book talks about that as well. Um, needless to say, I think it's completely fascinating and I hope everybody buys it and reads it, but um, uh, it has a lot of practical information about how, how to try to make sense of the stuff that is coming at us from all directions today. Thank you, Corey. And Laura Silverman said, sounds like Cornelia Dean's book should be required reading for every high schooler. So everyone, please make sure that the younger folks in your life and the older folks uh, get a chance to read this book available at all fine and not so fine bookstores available everywhere. Uh, the book is called, uh, the, bo the book I'm gonna show it to you again so that everybody can see it is called Making Sense of Science and everyone should get this book and it's uh, separating substance from spin is the book. When it came out, I was uh, extremely gratified and uh, also stunned. Um, the, El the Los Angeles Times said it was one of the 20 best books of the year. Which, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, that was exactly what I thought, wow. So, um, uh, so I, you know, I hope it's useful. My hope is to write a useful book that will help people, so. Well, you, you aren't just a writer and a journalist. You also do some unusual things. You make your own salt, I believe. Yes, that's true. Yes, yes. I have established a, uh, an exceptionally modest salt-making operation on the table on my deck on Chappaquiddick. And there it is. Um, it's so the, uh, the, the uh, seltzer bottles in the background, my friends and I go to the beach. We go out into the, you know, beyond the surf zone where the water's clear fill up the bottles with seawater, come home, put them in that tray. And the tray, I have to say, uh, that is a particularly fabulous tray, which I found at the thrift shop because it's dark. So it gets, you know, really hot. You put the, um, you, if you put a bottle of seltzer into that tray at the beginning of the day, that's about how much salt you'll get at the end of the day. You'll get about a quarter of a cup of salt. So, um, I, you know, so I make salt. Last summer was not a banner year because it was very humid. And the salt actually, if it's, if it's not actually dry salt that you can put in a jar at the end of the day, overnight, if it's humid, it will, salt draws moisture out of the air. So it, in the morning, your salt is wet again. But yes, it's been uh, hilarious and ridiculous. Um, so uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. I just give it to people as... Uh, you know, presents. So that's what I'm doing with it. So you mean we can't order the Chappaquiddick no, Island salt works yet? No, not yet. I did, although, um, so this is a business card that my uh, friend Tom's uh, niece made for me. She was interested in typography. So I said, well, here's a, here's a task. You could make a business card for me. And then um, uh, another friend of mine said, well, you have to get the domain name. 
And she said this to me across a dinner table back in the days when we were having dinner in restaurants. And uh, she got her um, cell phone out and registered it on the spot as, <laughs> as a domain name. But I haven't done anything with it because I'm uh, just, I don't know, I need a staff, I guess. But on the, <laughs> at the moment, the uh, salt, the Abacote guy on Saltworks, um, the income stream is not uh, big enough to support a technical staff. So. Oh, we understand. We understand how that works. Uh, Susan says, "What about microparticles of plastic in your salt?" Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> says that, and I just ignore it. Um, you know, there. I don't know. If if I were selling it, I suppose I would have to have incredible liability insurance. And I guess even you know, someone could say you gave me the salt and I inhaled some. Uh, microparticles of plastic in it but you know what i think microparticles of plastic are ubiquitous and if you are really in hopes of not ever having that you're you know you're out of luck um definitely you can't swim in the ocean if you think they're in there because you'll swallow salt water when you're swimming so i, I don't yeah. I worry about it wendy says love the salt making we'll try it myself next time i go to the beach so let's get the very quick recipe again salt water from the salt beach water. and then a pan, a sunny day, that's it. Okay, my wife Rupa has been making salt ourselves, uh, herself uh, by, uh, she had been, we had been gifted a brick of Himalayan salt. And the brick is, you're supposed to kind of shave it to make the salt. So instead she has broken that up and is boiling that and uh, or in water and separating it. And so we now have Himalayan salt, but in, the crystal form. So you someone know, else point. People have been making salt forever. And uh, I mean, I don't know uh, Indian, uh, modern Indian history very well, but I know that Gandhi, one of the, the things that Gandhi campaigned for was for people to make their own salt, because I guess the Raj had a, some kind of control over salt and he wanted people to take that control back for themselves. So people have been making it um, forever. I recently um, put solar panels on my house. So now I could actually dry my salt in the toaster oven with a clear conscience because I won't be drawing off the grid. So I might actually start doing that as well. But what you need okay. is the, you know, some seawater, a pan, and a sunny spot. That's great. And, uh, and you're absolutely right about Mahatma Gandhi and what he did with salt. The salt tax helped inspire millions of Indians to understand the brutal regime they were living under. And sometimes it's hard to spot the the kind of the oppression you are under. And Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar says very Gandhian, that salt making protocol. And uh, the very famous uh, Dundi salt march that Gandhi did was very, very important. Yeah. Kerry says, brilliant interview with Corey Dean and her book, Making Sense of Science. This is actually one of her books. The other book, Am I Making Myself Clear? A Scientist Guide to Talking to the Public. I think there's nothing more important to do now than to get clear information to the public in every sphere, but certainly in this one as well. An exceptionally modest salt making manufactory. And I love that a thrifted pan is a major component. I, Laura, I'd never seen uh, you know, the word thrifted used that way. And that's referring to a thrift store and buying something from a thrift store as thrifted. I love that. See, I'm learning so much on this uh, show myself. And uh, one of the questions that I want to do, get ben, getting back to the paper, we have about 40 minutes left with Corey Dean, and we have so much to go through. Mark Colancy's book covers salt pretty well, says Rajendra, who's a science writer here in New York. I wanted to show this particular story in the Times, disasters with twice the misery, when global warming collides with a pandemic. May I ask you, Corey, how much do you think the fact that we started by using the word global warming instead of climate change back in the late 80s, early 90s, has caused the confusion and allowed the fossil fuel folks and others to uh, jump in and say, every time there's any fluctuation in temperature where it's a little colder, they say, aha, there's no global warming. Do you think that was a mistake on part of media and everyone else? It might have been, but I, I think the real problem with the climate change issue uh, was the reluctance of the research community to make the case loudly and publicly 
at an early date. They made the case in the scholarly literature. The first National Academy report that went to a president that said, this is a problem we need to do something about, that report went to Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. And it's a really interesting thought experiment to just kind of ask yourself, suppose we had really galvanized on this issue in the 1960s, what would we be facing now? Well, we would not be, I'm going to Chappaquiddick Island where you know, the, the ferry that we have to take to the big island, the ferry, uh, the ferry access is underwater a lot now because of sea level rise. We would not be having that kind of stuff. The researchers were extremely reluctant to come out and say, we are seeing effects of this phenomenon. The atmospheric chemistry has been well known since about 1900. So we know that if you put these gases in the atmosphere, the planet is going to warm. We've known that for a long, long, long time. Um, the question was whether we were hearing the signal now, and they were reluctant to declare that because they could only say it with like, you know, at one point, 70% confidence that meant that humanity, human activity is already altering the climate. And I once heard a really uh, brilliant climate scientist whose name is Steven Schneider. He was from Stanford. And I heard him give a talk and he said, you know, the scientists won't come out and say this to the world because they're only 70% confident. And he said, if I told you there was a 70% chance there was botulism in your sandwich, would you eat your sandwich? And of course, the answer is no, we wouldn't. We would take action about this because it's too important. So they just, uh, they let the deniers get away with it for a long, long, long time. And the other people who let the deniers get away with it was the news media, including us, because we have a real strong tradition of letting everybody have their say. And this is what in that book that the uh, Am I Making Myself Clear book, there's a chapter in that book called The Problem of Objectivity. And that is what happens when you try to give all sides of the story or both sides of the story. Sometimes the story only has one side. But for example, vaccines are not a menace. That's the only side to the vaccine story. So, but we're reluctant to take sides. And we let people get away with saying things that we may have complete confidence are not true, but we're giving them their say. And what we have always done was to say, oh, well, we describe them as outliers, or we describe them as apart from the mainstream of science, or we say that their views have been rejected. But the fact is, the fact that we mention them at all is a much more powerful message to our readers than any amount of caveating. And that's the, pro that's the problem with objectivity. You, you know, we, you, we see this even in the political realm today. So um, I just don't know what the answer to that problem is. What scientists would say to me was, well, just tell the truth. So I don't know what the truth is. I don't have a, you know, I have no expert training of any kind. I'm just a journalist. So knowing the truth, it's difficult. And we fall back on this objectivity formula, and that is what gets us into trouble. And I would say, if I had to point to, pro, I would say the reluctance of scientists to speak out and the reluctance of the mainstream media to pull the plug on the deniers way sooner than we did. We, we finally did it, but it took us way too long to do it. Um, I agree. Do you have any tips for general interest reporters about covering studies, information about the COVID-19 pandemic, et cetera? This is from Rose Horowitz, who produces our daily COVID-19 show. And by the way, Corey, after a couple of weeks, we'd love to have you on there to talk specifically oh, yeah. about uh, COVID-19. There's a, there's a chapter in the new book, Making Sense of Science. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of material on how to read a study. And because um, scientific studies have a particular form. And so this uh, part of the book tells you how to navigate those um, documents. And, you know, what the, to look at what was the question, how are the methods to answer it, what are the conclusions, and so on. And I have to say, I say this in the book, 
that for me, when I'm reading a study, I get into, you know, I get into the deep weeds really fast in terms of um, not being able to understand the technical details. But you can absorb a lot just by looking at the, the parts of this, the beginning typically and the end, the conclusions and discussion at the end to see what the study means. But things to look at are, because we have it in our minds that the uh, placebo-controlled, double-blind controlled study is the gold standard of scientific research, but you can, you can encourage one result or another depending on how you design your study. So this chapter talks about this as well. Um, typically, the smaller the number of subjects, the less reliable the result is, which is what Claudia uh, Dreyfus was getting at when she said, would we have run that study with eight participants? So um, uh, anyway, so I would just refer you to the book. There's a lot of what I hope is helpful information in there about how to make your way through this kind of thing. Let's talk a little bit about the science coverage in the New York Times. You are the science editor of the New York Times. That yeah. feels, sounds to me like one of the marquee jobs at the paper. What was the birth of Science Today Tuesday like? And I just say, when I was the science editor of the Times, I told our publisher, the father of our present publisher, that I had the best job in the known universe. And I still believe that that's the case. It was absolutely incredibly fabulous, in part, in large part, because of working with people like Claudia and the other people on the science staff who are uh, the most astonishingly wonderful colleagues and competent journalists and so on. They, I can't say enough about them. They're fabulous. But anyway, did you want to know how Science Times came to be? Correct. And also, we're, we're, I'll give you a chance to give shout outs to some of the historic names around science coverage at the paper. Well, um, so what happened was Science Times was born in the uh, 1970s when um, New York City was broke, going broke. And the Times was not doing well financially. It was, you know, kind of a bad situation. And the Times, as was uh, typical in those days when times were hard, they would say, well, let's expand. Let's, you know, branch out. Let's do something new and different. So they, at that time, the paper had two sections. And they decided that they would have every day four sections. And one of them would be page one. One of them would be business news. One of them would be... Um, Metro, and one of them would be something else. So the question is, what would the something else be every day? And Monday, they decided it would be sports. Wednesday, for some reason, has always been in the news business, the food day. That's the day that all the grocery stores advertise was Wednesdays. So Wednesdays was food. Thursdays, um, they decided would be uh, style. Fridays was weekend, which was because people would be planning what were they going to do for the weekend. And the question was Tuesday. And the business side said, well, why don't you have fashion? Why don't you make that your subject on Tuesday? We could sell a lot of ads related to fashion. And the executive editor of the Times at the time, who's uh, Abe Rosenthal, said, no, that Tuesday section has to be something that has some intellectual bite. And they decided to create Science Times. And for a long time, it was uh, kind of a drain on the operation. It didn't generate a lot of advertising revenue at the beginning. But that changed with the advent of computers. Of course, now nothing in print, print advertising is um, really faded uh, totally. But anyway, that was the origin of it. And some of the um, greatest science writers ever have worked there. Um, Walter Sullivan, who was, he, I used to get a kick out of this because People would call him the Dean of American Science Writers. And of course, my name is Dean, so I don't, that always struck me as funny. But anyway, um, Walter was an amazing science writer. Among other things, um, people say it was his coverage of the development of the theory of tectonic plates that led the geology community to think maybe there might be something to it, which there is. Walter has a mountain range named after him in Antarctica which is not something too many journalists can claim. Um, John Noble Wilford, who covered the uh, aerospace and archeology span brilliantly, he used to say his beat was long ago and far away. 
Um, John's retired now. He was fabulous. Um, Malcolm Brown, who was one of the heroes of the, the hero journalists of the war in Vietnam. Malcolm was one of the two or three most important. But he came at the, at, toward the end of his career, he came to science and he had trained originally as a chemist and he was a fabulous, fabulous writer, just absolutely fantastic. But um, lots of, I'm afraid like to name the people I worked with because I'll leave somebody out. I mean, they were just, uh, you know, um, Jim Glantz was one of the people who did that story about the modeling that we just um, had. Uh, he came to us as a PhD physicist. I hired him because we needed someone to um, write about hard science. And he had been writing for the journal Science. Um, so he came on board. And then after a, a while, he decided to go, he actually went to Baghdad. He went to the Baghdad Bureau. And then he became an investigative reporter. So he's fabulous. Donald McNeil, who had been reporting in um, Africa and, and elsewhere, he came to us to write about health. And he has created his extremely successful uh, beat as um, the diseases of the world's poor, the diseases of the third world. And I have to say when he first proposed it, I didn't know whether we, you know, we could make it fly, but he did. Um, he did a, he did a, he's, he is continuing to do a really fantastic job. But there are tons of people. Claudia does interviews with uh, scientists. Which was and when I when we started doing that, my idea was to let the readers hear the voices of scientists with the minimal amount of uh, editorial intervention, which is kind of what Claudia succeeds in doing. Um, but there are you know there are lots and lots and lots of people who are just fabulous. Um, so I don't you know I'm afraid to I'm afraid to sing. I don't I, I love them all. I can't. They're just an incredible bunch of people and it was a real real um gift yeah, I, uh, what what a what a walk through history and that's what therese steiner who's been tweeting up a storm therese thank you so much she says she loves this history and by the way i heard a quote from chris gorman my friend yesterday who said if you're ever leaving out and worried about leaving out names and that keeps you from thanking people he said that a rapper once said that any omissions are blame the head, not the heart. And that I think is what is uh, what you're doing here as well. And I think it's fair to say that those people know how I feel about them. I haven't made any bones about it. So, you know, I just admire and love them to pieces. They're absolutely wonderful. But can I tell that's, you- That's great. Can I, can I tell you a funny story? How I got to be put in the science department? I was working on the national desk. Unbeknownst to me, there was a temporary opening for like a third tier editor in that department. And someone saw me walking through the newsroom carrying a copy of Scientific American. And on the strength of that, and I am not making this up, I was moved to the science department. That's how I <laughs> And that was one of those serendipitous things that, of course, uh, uh, changed the course of your career. And and that's, that, that this kind of thing does this happen. Speaking of careers, can you talk a little bit about Don, uh, about Donald McNeil and the recent controversy that some of our viewers may have heard about, but others haven't? You know, I um, I haven't. I can't say much about this because I didn't see Donald was interviewed on television. I believe is that right? Yeah. And. Uh, I didn't see the interview and um, I gather he spoke more frankly on television than we would typically speak in the news columns. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, it is. And uh, He was critical of Mike Pence. Yeah. So, you know, a certain number of people got agitated about that. Um, the only thing that I will say is uh, Donald McNeil is an exemplary journalist, full stop. Um, also, the New York Times is an exemplary news organization, full stop. That's really all I want to say about that. I, I will say that there were people who were upset about what he said, but there were also people upset that the New York Times didn't have his back on this. And this is where some of the criticism of the New York Times comes from, whether you know the 
what you described as both sides and naming, you know, how much do, coverage do you give to both sides and how much can you plain speak plainly about what is happening? That's where, uh, you know, I would look at this, if we can look at that headline again, the New York Times reporter calls Pence a sycophant. The Times says he went too far. Every measure of that word, if you look up in the dictionary, it's a perfect description of Michael Pence, our pre vice president of the United States. So, but this is where the Times, in trying to be so careful, uh, is, it can be seen by others as, uh, as being too careful and not speaking as the way it should. And that's fascinating for us as media critics and people who admire the Times for what they do. Every time, for example, we talk about the New York Times in my newsletter, or even on this show, when we say we're talking about the New York Times, people accuse me of being too friendly and complain that the New York Times is trying to balance and have this false equivalency. That's, it. as I think I was trying to say before, I, I think that, that the question of objectivity, the question of false equivalence, the question of balance, I think that is the most intractable problem definitely in science journalism and maybe in journalism altogether. It's an absolutely intractable, difficult problem that we have yet to find a good answer for. And years ago when scientists would say to me, why don't you just tell the truth? And I would say to them, be careful what you ask for because you might get it. And <laughs> one way in which we have gotten that is Fox News and Rush Limbaugh and all of those people who are just telling the truth as they see it. And then we have another side with other people on the left who are telling the truth as they see it. And what happens? Our audience is fragmented. I'm not, I, I, I don't know what the answer to that problem is. I will only say that that is a big, big, big problem. And it's one of the things you have to navigate as a consumer of the news. I couldn't agree more about that. So thank you. And let's move on. Let's uh, look at the rest of the paper. We only have about 15 minutes with you and we have so much to cover. So let's go in here and just look at uh, some of the other sections, the Sunday review of the New York Times, why we should stop asking pundits to predict the future after the coronavirus. No one knows what's going on. Frank, Mark Lilla's piece in here. Will warm weather save us? My so strawberry seedling got a virus, disease detectives meet the politicians. These are all, this looks like the science section, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I have to say, I haven't gotten that far into the paper yet this morning. So I don't, you know, I haven't read any of that stuff, but I, I, uh, I am sick and tired of reading various people's predictions about what's going to happen because it hasn't happened yet. As an old boss of my fabulous old, managing editor at the Providence Journal, Donald B. Smith, as he used to say, when it happens, it will be news. Until it happens, it's not news. I think there's way too much uh, prognosticating um, that is necessarily helpful for us. Here is, uh, we're looking at the, the section here, COVID dreams, Trump nightmares, mooring doubts, call him Ross doubt, that's call him the end of the new world order, Ahmed anti-globalist paranoia, the real globalism is disintegrating, crumbs for the hungry, windfalls for the rich, Nick Kristof, billions are going to zillionaires uh, under the guise of pandemic relief. And then this story for a change of pace, nothing to do with COVID-19. Why does the US military celebrate white supremacy? I have not read this story. I'm not sure exactly what part of this they're, they're talking about. Uh, dishonored Confederate generals and oh. other things that are in the story. Go ahead. No, nothing. I mean, you know, that that's, I heard that and I thought, really? But, you know, the ger generals of the Confederacy, um, I don't know. I don't know the, I don't know the story. Uh, I'm looking at it here now, but I mean, uh, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I can think of a reason why I would teach um, the tactics that the, some of the generals of the Confederacy used in their war fighting, because some of them were very effective generals. But um, 
Uh, no, of course, white supremacy uh, is not what we need. So I, you know. Uh, oh, well, it's I, a rare full page editorial in the New York Times editorial, uh, you know, an unsigned editorial. Let's look at some of the uh, obituaries. I love reading obituaries. Of course, we mourn the people who die, but it's a way to celebrate their lives. And uh, I think the New York Times has done a better job in recent years by going out and looking for women and people of color to cover in yeah. these pages. Roddy McCoy, 97, educator who started New York City school wars is dead. His transfer of white teachers gave the conflict a racial cast. Phil May, 75, singer whose band foresh foreshadowed punk rock, The Pretty Things in 1964. And, uh, and then these pages and pages of people who, these are the paid notices. And look at the sports section. Corey, which is usually on Sunday, its own section reduced to two pages. No, well, that and was a big deal when they stopped doing that on Sunday and travel as well. But people yeah. are traveling and they're, you know. Yeah. And uh, here we go. The Sunday style section, Beach Towns Brace for Deluge. And a reality star sought masks. It got messy. Bethany Frankel tried to aid governments in aid and ran into ex-cons and exaggerations. So it shows you that even well-meaning people will have trouble doing all of this. One for the road? No, for the sidewalk. With most bars still take out only, Americans are sipping and sauntering or walktailing instead of cocktailing. I had not heard that word before. Me neither, but it's a great word. <laughs> TikTok houses as their shelter in the storm. Uh, no saying, not saying my dog is Cupid, but it's hard to argue with the results, though this wasn't about us, it was about Tilly. And this is the modern love column. We don't have time to read that, but I can read you tiny love stories, everything new for you. Barbecue, introduction, joke, smile, friend request, message sent, first date, loud restaurant, easy conversation, second date, sushi, who cares if I've never eaten it? I'll try it for you. Third date, meeting your friends. I'm not too social, but for you, I'll try to be. This isn't serious, I say. This isn't serious, we say. One, two, three, four, five years pass. This isn't still serious. Who wants to be serious? Still, we don't know what to expect, but why obsess with expectations? I will still try everything new for you because I love you. Alex Federau's tiny love story, beautifully written. Okay, one of the things we do, uh, Corey, is to read the social cue section and to ask one question out loud to you well, and there is no right or wrong answer. This is Philip Galanza's column, and uh, we'll just see what you say. Uh, hey, I'm running here. Since our stay-at-home order, I've had to change my running patterns. I now run past a residential garage at 7 a.m. In inside, an elderly couple smokes and runs a fan that blows cigarette smoke onto the sidewalk. I try to remember to run on the other side of the street, but I often forget. I think it's outrageous that I'm forced to breathe in secondhand smoke. Should I write the couple a letter, asks Karen. And before you answer, I'll just say, isn't it nice that we have kind of everyday problems to write to the New York Times about? And uh, we're not, this is not a COVID-19 question. So, <laughs> uh, I, I have a few uh, thoughts about that. Um, one is that if your life is going so brilliantly, that you have the time and the emotional energy to get agitated about this, I can only say, congratulations, well done. <laughs> Are you really suggesting that people don't have the right to smoke inside their own homes and uh, you know blow the air out the window or out the door? I, you know, really? Uh, okay, uh, I would not go that far and I, have absolutely nothing good to say about smoking or cigarette smoke, which I detest. Um, uh, get All right, let's see what he said. What does he say? Yeah, wouldn't it be easier to just cross the street? Absent a law or homeowner rule that forbids smoking on the property, the couple is probably free to do so. And the inconvenience to you seems minor. Of course, I wish all these people would abstain from smoking, but this is a stressful time and probably not the easiest one to kick a nicotine habit. I'd skip the letter for now. Brilliant. So you both are thinking the same. And look at how the New York Times wow section has changed. Here is 
the socially distant wedding. Here is Zwedding. I've not heard that word before, but this is a Zoom wedding. is known as a Zwedding, apparently. Ah, and, what? And, and, wedding. <laughs> and then also how the New York Times has changed over the years. Uh, they are celebrating same-sex marriage here. Olivia Hall and Olivia Rini. This is unusual in another way. Two Olivias become one. And uh, just fascinating to see how the New York Times has changed and evolved. Also, some of the people featured in these would not traditionally have been considered worthy of the social register in the old days. Sheltering in place with a boyfriend and no booze. Is the wedding off for now? Here's what to do next. So very useful. I, I have a couple of weddings that we were supposed to go to that I will need to check out. And I don't think I've ever seen a graduation announcement in the New York Times, but Maximilian Stabler, MD, just got one. I don't know how much this costs, but wow, it does stand out. Good for you. <laughs> Have you ever seen one? No, but yeah, I- So there's another revenue stream for the New York Times, isn't it? Well, I'm in favor of all revenue streams for the New York Times, so. All right, uh, we're running out of time here, but we do want to look at the magazine what we've learned in quarantine. So let me ask you, Corey, what have you learned in quarantine? I've learned how incredibly fortunate I am. And uh, I hope that the experience causes me to be a little bit more useful to uh, the world going forward. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just have to spin the camera around. We want to make sure we catch all the great comments that are coming in uh, from folks as well. And we also want to uh, just... Uh, make sure we look at the behind the scenes or behind the cover section of the New York Times Magazine, which is always so beautifully done. So it's just a minute, 30 seconds, and let's watch. From the New York Times Magazine, this is Behind the Cover. This week, we have a really special issue about the experience of quarantine. It's a package of contributions from writers, visual artists, and photographers who are all wrestling with the question of what we've learned about ourselves and about society from this strange collective experience. We knew we wanted to unify the issue with one visual style. So we decided to work with the illustrator, Brian Ray. Because the content could be quite dark at points, we really liked the idea of working with someone who could bring some lightness and humor to it. Brian's illustrations really get at all the things that we're feeling right now. Anxiety, boredom, sometimes insanity, the monotony of it all. It seemed important for the cover to capture the passage of time because there is a very different quality to the life in quarantine that we're having now, two and a half months in, than there was in the first two weeks when everything was novel. Of all the sketches that he sent, the one that we were drawn to was the snail making concentric lines around the person. It's such a brilliant encapsulation of the experience of quarantine. It feels like a representation of the physical enclosure of quarantine, but the longer you stare at it, it also really seems like a representation of the psychological constraints that we're all living under right now. Brian said, we may all feel like this girl on the cover, but I've never drawn a line that didn't have an end. Hopefully this one does soon. What do you think, Corey? Well, I, I think it's I think it's a really um, it's good in so many ways. I mean, they're not talking about the fact that it is uh, it's kind of three dimensional. It looks like a like a tunnel that this person is at the end of, surrounded by these lines. That's not my experience of quarantine. So, um, it personally, uh, because my life is not that different. But um, except for no socializing in the evenings. But I write. I'm a writer. I write at home. So I'm still a writer. Still writing at home. Right. Uh, look at all these. These are like mini essays uh, that so many people have written. This is one of the things that uh, my wife and I always talk about. That who has time to read all this, even quarantine or not? And have you, you know, in in, in New York City, as you know, you get the New York Times half on Saturday so that you can get a jump start. And it's still impossible to read all this. I think one of the things, I mean, the Times actually one, at one point did an advertising campaign, the gist of which was you don't have to read all of it. <laughs> and you don't, you know, you can read whatever you want. So. Are, are you a crossword puzzler? Yes, but not the sun. I don't, I, uh, 
I don't enjoy the Sunday puzzle, but I do the daily puzzle. I do the daily puzzle every day. Uh, is this unusual to have color? I'm sorry? Is it unusual to have color in the uh, this yellow color like this? Well, it's not unusual for some squares to be colored, but this is uh, today. That's a large number of colored squares. Somewhere in here, there's going to be some quasi explanation of why some of the squares are colored. But um, uh, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, one thing people have uh, said I should try spelling bee, which I have tried. And I'm so bad at it that I just don't enjoy it at all. So I don't think I'm going to give that a miss going forward, I think. All right. Before we let you go, uh, since you're an author, we wanted to just uh, talk about the book review. Uh, what are bo some books that you're recommending now to people apart from your own that they should be reading? Oh, um, oh boy. Uh, I hate that question because my mind instantly goes blank. Okay. <laughs> the, I won't put you on the spot. I'll just We'll just look at look at what's what's new and what's uh... so one book that I'm reading. It's not a new book. It came out a while ago, but I, uh, I'm in hopes that it will be illuminating. It, although it's really depressing. It's called Hitler's Willing Executioners, and it's a book about how people went along with Hitler, who you would not think would ordinarily sign up for a murderous fascist dictatorship. And how did that happen? And I, I was trying to, uh, I, I, I got interested in this uh, because I saw, I think the Times actually reprinted an, or a headline from um, years ago uh, that said, uh, uh, you know, Hitler had come to power, and the headline was, German, the German stock market shrugs off Hitler coming to power. And I thought, obviously, about our country and the, the boom in the stock market before the corona pandemic, before the pandemic. You know, how is this possible? So I people recommended that book, so I got that book. And I've also finished the third installment of Hilary Mantel's series on um, Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII, which is, uh, I think the first one is the best, the second one is the second best, and this is the third best. But even third best from her is pretty good. So I can recommend that. There are a lot of dead bodies in this third volume, but never mind. <laughs> I, can, I can understand that. Uh, and uh, Hitler's Willing Executioners is an amazing book that I recommend to everybody all the time because oh, it captures how people are willing to just look overlook certain things in order to yeah. Uh, benefit in other ways, and that's really sad. And that's the book by Daniel Jonah Goldhagen uh, right. that you that that you've uh, that you've mentioned. And uh, uh, there are several other books uh, about about the rise of Hitler that I think are uh, useful for us to kind of think about um, during all of this. There's also Ron Rosenbaum's book called uh, "Explaining Hitler: The Search for the Origins of His Evil," and uh, there's a picture of baby Hitler on the cover. Uh, that uh, is worth looking at. Uh, uh, Danielle Flood, one of our former guests of, of the New York Times, read along. She said that Abe Rosenthal used to say, "There's a rare person who reads the f entire New York Sunday New York Times," and uh, uh, who actually read. Maybe even the editor of the New York Times doesn't have time to read the entire New York Times. No, there's a there's a lot. But the the thing I love about reading it uh, on paper is that if I'm turning the pages, my eye will fall on every article that's in the paper. I might not read them, but I will see everything that's in the paper. And I find myself reading all kinds of things that I would never in a million years have sought out, but there they are and I'm reading them. And that kind of serendipity I think is priceless. And it does not I understand, I understand. to the same degree. I understand that. Yeah, no, I understand you assigned the print paper to your students and that you're also not the world's biggest fan of uh, teaching by Zoom. Well, I guess it's a matter of getting used to it. I really uh, am a great believer in being able to really see people's body language. And, you know, if you're especially if you're a teacher and you're trying to explain something and you watch the veil of incomprehension, you know, drop before your students, you can see that in person. 
in a way that I personally have difficulty seeing online. So I just don't enjoy. And plus, I'm always like, oh, my God, what's my hair doing? You know, and um, <laughs> for some reason, I'm not conscious of that when I'm in person, but I am when I'm on Zoom. And that's just a distraction. So. Sure. I, I'm. I know I understand completely uh, what you, what you mean. So uh, before we let you go, we just want to uh, get your thoughts on what are the, some things that people should be paying attention to as the news evolves. We're saying that no one knows what's going to happen after the pandemic, but what are some things to look for in news coverage and in developments? Oh boy, um, I don't know what I would suggest that people look for. What I'm going to be looking for is when are students going to be able to go back to school? Because I think the sooner the schools can be open, the better. I saw something, there's a, there's a pediatric epidemiologist named John Christakis, who I quote in, the, in Making Sense of Science on the subject of uh, peanut allergies and food allergies in children. He believes that they are exaggerated, that the prevalence of those allergies is exaggerated. But um, he was talking about schools and children in school. And he said that he thought that school committees, town, you know, cities and towns with school systems should take as an operating principle that schools must open in the fall, that it's imperative that school, students be able to go back to school in the fall. And they should be thinking now about what has to happen to make that possible. And I am looking for signs that that kind of thinking is going on, and I hope to see it. Apparently, there are countries in Europe that are doing, you know, four days on, 10 days off schedules. I mean, there are all kinds of different things that we could do. But that I'm so I'm looking for that. I'm looking for uh, people being able to go back to work and how many businesses have been killed by the um by the pandemic and i'm afraid there are going to be two you know well any was any even one is too many but um and um i suppose we're going to start to see what are the health consequences of um the lockdown as of the of the economic damage the health consequences of the economy's uh troubles as well as the virus so i guess that's what i'm looking for but i you know I wouldn't tell anybody else what they should be looking for. I appreciate that. I want uh, everyone to know that uh, Corey Dean's book is something you should be all buying. It's called Making Sense of Science and How to Separate Substance from Spin. She says, don't worry if you don't get the cover. You'll get everything else inside it. And uh, you can buy that right now. And it's a Lo Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist and was named by the LA Times as one of the 20 best books of the year. So make sure you get that. Make sure people in your life can uh, can, uh, can see it. And Corey did mention businesses is in trouble, including journalism businesses. The New York Times is doing great under this pandemic, and we're, uh, we're happy to see that. But so many local news operations have ceased uh, working right now. And this is the worst time this could happen, not just in the human toll, but also because their readers need journalism now more than ever. I'm wearing uh, a shirt from a company that I got a chance to go and do some social media training several years ago called Kalkins Media. It no longer exists, not because of COVID, but this is the consolidation of American newspapers. And they ran several newspapers and TV stations, and it's gone. Their Wikipedia entry says Kalkins Media was a media organization, and it's completely gone. And it's so sad when that happens. Again, the journalists lose their jobs, but readers suffer and they don't even know they're suffering. Right, I, no, you're, it's, it's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. Yeah, so with that, we are going to let Corey go and tell you, tell everyone, including Corey, who our next guest is. We're very excited for next week's show because let's pull on the screen here. Uh, we are going to be talking about economics and other issues uh, on next on uh, next Sunday with Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist and author of 40 books, mostly on economics that you uh, many people obviously know and many people know Joe's name. And Joe will be reading the New York Times with us next Sunday, 
8.30 to 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. Everybody will want to tune in. Just like today, we will get a chance to learn a little bit about Joe, talk a little bit about the pandemic, uh, get his prescriptions for the economy, just as we got Corey's prescriptions for dealing with fake information. So uh, everyone tune in 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. Again, to see the archives of this show and all the shows we do, become a subscriber of my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash 3net, youtube.com slash 3net. Corey, any final words from you before we go on? We've got a doctor who's standing by and let's bring her on as well because we'll do our sponsorship break before we speak to the doctor, but we'll make sure she's ready to go as well. No, just thank you for this opportunity to reach out to people. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I, I'm going to just ask the doctor to come on if she's ready, Dr. Gita Nair, because she was watching very intently and she was posting on social. Uh, Gita, what did you think of Cornelia's comments today? Oh, fabulous. Spot on, Cornelia. Again, I'm a fan. Um, I appreciate the walnut explanation. I was confused by that. I do admit it. Um, but, you know, science and the translation of it is really what it's about right now. And I think you've built such a beautiful career based on that. So I thank you as a physician. I think the medical community that continues to, to watch this unravel appreciates the work you do. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. Bye, Corey. Uh, um, good luck with everything. And we expect you to be a, uh, you know, a very successful salt business person very it's, soon. No, it's a purely a voluntary uh, effort. You know, no, it's not going to move the market. So. Not right. too much. It raises your blood pressure. Be careful there. I got to say that. I, I, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't. <laughs> it's, it's more salty. So you use less of it to get the same. Oh. Better. Even better. So. That's great. Okay. Bye, Corey. Okay. Bye bye. I'm so I'm turning off now, right? Yes, you are. Thank okay. you very much. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. All right. And Gita, Gita Nair, our doctor who is going to join us for the next half hour, please stand by. We're going to bring Neil on so that we can thank our sponsors and remind everyone that you can sponsor the show. You can sponsor next week's show with Joe Stiglitz, who is the Nobel Prize winning economist, who will be a guest with us 8.30 a.m. Eastern time on Sunday. All right, Neil, let's get to the sponsors and then let's get to our doctor. Absolutely. Thank you, Shri. Uh, what a great show again with uh, uh, Cornelia Dean, former science editor for the New York Times, uh, covering the history of Science Tuesday, uh, science coverage in the paper, her book, her salt making, uh, absolutely uh, loved it. Um, and for people who uh, maybe have, were tuning in in the middle of the show, again, uh, Cornelia Dean, a former science editor, and we have uh, Geetha Nair, uh, uh, Dr. Gita Nair, who has an MD and MBA, Chief Medical Officer for Greenway, will be joining us in just a moment. Um, but of course, first, we need to pay some bills and thank our sponsors. Um, so why don't we go ahead and, and start with Muckrack, Shri? Thank you. Our friends at Muckrack have launched Muckrack Academy, and we're doing a free certification program, Fundamentals of Social Media for Journalists, PR Pros, and Everyone. It starts in June. It's a very short course, but we believe it is going to be the most useful way to upskill and everyone have a baseline knowledge of social. Go to mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. It's open to everyone anywhere in the world can participate. So please go to mrac.co slash social. This is free everywhere on the planet because we believe everyone needs to have a fundamental understanding of social media. So please go to mrac.co slash social, muckrack academy, and thank you uh, for uh, helping us think of a way of helping people. Millions of people around the world can be helped. We already have had 3,000 people sign up in just a week. So let's get more people. You tell your friends and everyone, they'll get a certificate at the end of it uh, for, this, uh, for this program. Absolutely. We'd also like to recognize Magic Bus USA, another one of our sponsors uh, for the work that they do. Um, Magic Bus USA uh, uh, imagines a world where children break out of poverty and lead fulfilling, rewarding lives, contributing to their community and to the world around them. And as you can see, uh, in India, seven out of 10 adolescents do not have a higher secondary qualification 
six out of 10 youth do not have the soft skills necessary for employment, and three out of 10 girls are married before they reach 18 years of age. Uh, so thank you, Magic Bus, for your support of the New York Times Read Along. Uh, and in addition to Muckrack and Magic Bus USA, we would also like to thank Strategy Focus Group. Um, Strategy Focus Group is a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. Uh, thank you again to Muckrack, uh, Greg Gallant and Mike Schneider, Magic Bus USA, our friend Pradnia Haldapur, and Strategy Focus Group, Ron Thomas, for your support of the New York Times Read Along. Thank you all. And if you'd like to sponsor this show, including next week's show with Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, please email us. The rates are very reasonable. And we also have another show, which is our daily program around COVID-19. Please check that out as well. All of it is available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash 3net. And tonight's show is our positivity show. And we'd love to tell you more about that later. Patricia Tanaka, who is the chief joy officer at Joyful Planet, will be our guest 9 p.m. Eastern time uh, later tonight. So make sure you check that out. And if you have any questions about any of the things we've thrown at you today, just email me, 3 at 3.net at three on Twitter, at three net on YouTube and on Instagram. All right, let's bring back Dr. Nair. Absolutely, we have a, a number of questions that are coming in for Dr. Nair, so we'll bring her back in. Uh, Dr. Nair, thank you again for joining us. We really look forward to this part of the show. This has been, uh, we started this uh, uh, several weeks ago, I think in March, having a doctor join us uh, because we saw there were a number of questions that people had and we saw this as a service that we could offer to our community. Uh, so, Sheree, I'll, I'll go back into the comments and, and look for uh, some of the questions that have come up, but maybe Dr. Nair can talk a little bit about her background and, and uh, the work that she's doing while we do that. Sure, happy to. Thank you so much. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, just want to first thank, thank everyone again, you know, the frontline workers, all of the folks that we think about here on Memorial Day weekend, and, and just remembering that we really are in this together. As far as my background, I'm a rheumatologist, just like Dr. Mongo, who you had on uh, last weekend. And um, I'm also the chief medical officer for Greenway Health. I work in health technology, which you can imagine is a really budding field, especially as we try to think of how we can get physicians to practice virtually. You talked about the Z-wedding, so we're trying to do the same thing in medicine given the pandemic, but it, it certainly is humbling times and an interesting time to be in medicine. So really appreciate the dialogue and looking forward to answering any questions uh, out there. And we, we will certainly have a lot of questions. I know, Doc, that you like to go by Dr. G as you're, you're trying to get, make it easier for people to, uh, to say your name. Uh, that reminds me of Dr. Lakshmanan Satyavagishwaran, who was the LA Times medical examiner during the OJ Simpson trial. And uh, on, in, on NBC News, Tom Brokaw said, uh, you know, uh, said that we're just gonna call him Dr. L. Uh, and even on the stand, he was addressed as Dr. L. And he had a much more difficult name than Gita. And so in this show, we will call you Gita Nair, but your Miami audience uh, knows you as Dr. G. So let's get right to it. Uh, thank you again for being here. And you're a double threat because you're an MD and an MBA. And we should never forget that hospitals and the medical profession is a business and that they, uh, that people who work there need to make sure that they can uh, support the very large number of people who work there. And that's very important. By the way, on my daily show, we had, uh, we had guests from the Northwell system, which uh, the hospital system that has treated more COVID patients than any other system in the country. And uh, they were, we had a nurse on and the chief comms officer, Terry Lyman, and, and we were talking about how difficult it is for medical systems at this moment. Uh, now that elective surgery is being opened up again, things may get a little easier, but they're under very hard financial pressure. Let's go to Susan Stein, who asks, I'm going to ask my question again about a potential vaccine. If the disease itself has not been shown to elicit an immune response, why do we think a vaccine 
is likely to do so. I'm trying to wrap my head around all this. It's very scary, and I want to be as informed as I can before I head back into the world. Thank you, Susan, for that question and your support of the show. Let's go to Dr. Geeta Nair to get her answers. Sure. So, you know, Susan, really appreciate the question. So, so let's just back up for a second, right? The reason we're in the situation that we're in is we actually need three things. It's not just about a vaccine, right? We've got to have testing, we've got to have tracking, and then ultimately we need a treatment or a vaccine. So I know there's been a lot of dialogue around vaccines. There's certainly been a lot of investment in this space, but we are still building the car as we're driving it. So there's a lot for us to, to unravel here. And when you say that the virus is not causing an immune reaction, that's not necessarily true. So let me translate that a little bit. It, it's not creating immunity to the virus in many cases. So it's about us understanding the disease, getting more into the science, and ultimately either looking for a treatment or a vaccine. And so what does that mean exactly for people who are trying to understand this? Sure. So what that means is that we've got to keep doing what we're doing, right? The, the front cover of the New York Times today couldn't be more humbling. Where we want to focus is making sure that list doesn't grow. So the only thing that we know to date is that we need to keep our distance six feet or more. We've got to be wearing masks. We've got to be keeping good hand hygiene, which means washing your hands and being really thoughtful about how much we individually decide to reopen because there are many, many different factors at play and it's not that simple. And we simply don't, we simply don't have a treatment or a vaccine. And so until that point, the things we need to do really remain the same as they did before we went into lockdown mode. So just, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. We need to keep doing what we're doing very cautiously, very methodically, and really keeping in mind what's going on with your particular region and locality as well. So how do you feel about the way we're opening up right now, including in Florida, your own state, what's happening there? I see very few people who are keeping distance, at least on the TV things we see. There are obviously millions of Americans keeping distance, but what about in places where they're not? Sure. So, you know, you know, as far as the, the government officials and regulations here in Florida, South Florida is a little bit different, right? Miami-Dade has more cases than anywhere else in the state. We're slowly reopening. We're, you know, we're letting restaurants open 50% of capacity. Same with salons. Uh, the beaches, Miami Beach in particular, is closed. But folks are hitting the waterways. You see a lot of people on their boats, the yachting, the kayaking. And, and you know, so far this weekend, I don't know if it's because Mother Nature's still in charge and it's been raining all weekend. We haven't had any major incidents. The, the only arrests so far have been some folks protesting on Miami Beach. So, so we're still going slow. And, of course, there will be folks that simply don't heed the guidelines or it, it's simply difficult, right? I think everyone's getting tired and exhausted. So it's it's really about measuring your own individual risk and asking the question, is it worth it, right? And everyone's gonna have a different answer, whether they're deciding to go out to eat, whether they're deciding to go out and meet family or whether they're just tired of being home. So I, I think you've got to weigh that individual risk and, and ask that question and then say, okay, if I'm going to take the risk, how do I stay six feet apart? How, how do I, you know, be able to wash my hands frequently? And how do I keep not just myself safe, but ensure that when I come back home, I'm not putting anyone else in my family at risk. And, and you know, we're all going to have different answers for that question. And these, these are things patients are asking me, right? So we're all going to have to weigh this. And, and fundamentally, the only people who can keep you healthy at this moment is really going to be you and, and your family or the folks that you're, you're hunkered down with. Because this is clearly very hard for government officials, the police to even execute. And on some of these guidelines, right? It's, it's hard to know who's in, in what camp when you're at the beach, who's supposed to be together, who's not. So a lot of this is really going to be some personal responsibility. And we're, and we're seeing that. And some are taking it serious and others are not. And, and we will all pay the price. Uh, Dan, Danielle asks something along these lines. What do you think of the increase in businesses opening in, in, in 50 states despite the continued increases of COVID-19 deaths? Sure. So again, this this is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. I think we all can appreciate that there's an ideal scenario and then there's a realistic scenario. So I, I think very clearly 
we're at a place where, where folks are getting tired. The economics of things are really weighing on, on individuals' and mental health aspects. As far as the science, nothing has changed. So again, it, it's about how do you keep the science and the facts there to protect you? We prevent that list from growing. You saw it on the front page. But how do you do that safely as we, as we reopen? So I'm telling folks the same stuff. You gotta wash your hands, you gotta wear a mask, you gotta stay six feet apart, and you need to kind of do an individual toll and assessment, right? Do you and your family have health insurance? Do you have a savings? Do you have a primary care doctor that should you get sick or someone in your family should get sick? Are you able to easily get an appointment? easily get a test. Uh, when we think about children going back to summer camps and schools, you know, does, do any of the children in the family have asthma? Um, does anyone have, you know, vulnerable folks in the home? So, so these are going to be different answers for different individuals and families. So I would say that again, first question you have to ask yourself is, is it worth it? And if you make the decision that it is, how do you ensure that you go through your checklist and make sure that you are doing the best you can? Because really, you know, no, no one has all the answers, right? None of us have all the answers. And, and the answers we're putting out into the world are clearly not okay with everyone because we are opening. So it's, it's about taking measured risk at this point. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Nair, you have a question from Patricia Freudenberg who says, what platform do you like for virtual health services? Sure. So, so great question. For, first of all, I'll say that digital doctors, you know, the more savvy you are now with technology, the, the better you're going to be able to reach your patients because so many of our patients, they don't want to come in, right? They're, they're scared of going to the doctor's office, scared of coming to the hospital. So it, it doesn't really matter what your platform is, right? What matters now is making sure that you're able to get right care for the right patient at the right time. Um, one of the jokes that I make with, with my docs is, is having good website manner instead of bedside manner. You know, I'm teaching folks not to, uh, not to show their nostrils on the camera and, and how to make sure that they can make their patients feel comfortable even when they're kind of, you know, feel a little bit uncomfortable in this new virtual age. Um, I also think social media, digital marketing, you need to have that presence now if you're a physician or, or a provider group out there because this really is the new way to engage with patients and consumers. Um, I signed up for your course, Sri, by the way, on, on uh, Muckrack. So I, I think the more, we, we have physicians now and patients now that are one, ready for the technology, but two, really see that it's it's uh, it's been there all along. So it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. I think it's about keeping the human connection and being able to add that value, whatever platform you decide to use. Thank you. She just mentioned my Muckrack Academy course that anybody can sign up for. It's free, the certification in social media. Go to mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. And here is more information about Gita Nair, she is an MD and an MBA and health, healthcare's change maker. She was named one of those folks and healthcare and information technology. Uh, how did you decide to get an MBA? You know, I'll tell you, like everything else, it was a happenstance and a journey. I, you know, I learned really on, really early on in my medical career that the biggest way to make an impact on the front lines was understanding the back end. And understanding the business of medicine was just as important as understanding the front lines. You know, it's it's interesting to see the dialogue in healthcare play out, where where people say, "Gosh, you know, the emergency room really is a battlefield." Um, it's always been a battlefield, right? And and oftentimes the the medical staff is kind of at at um, it ends with administrators that say, no, you can't admit that patient or no, financially, this doesn't make sense. And, and we as the clinicians are there saying, but I know this will make an impact. I know the science. And so getting my MBA was a big part of my mission to say, look, I get the, the science and the business. And I promise if you marry the two, it can be a win-win for all. So, and I, I think that's playing out more than ever today as well. Well, let's give people your contact information. You're on Twitter. G Nair is your Twitter handle. Your website is GeetaNair.com so that people can find you. And then people love IG. Instagram is Dr. G. Nair on Instagram. And Facebook is Dr. Gita Nair. And LinkedIn, she is Gita Nair. Again, GeetaNair.com has all of this uh, on there. So uh, we are happy that you are one of those doctors who sees the value in sharing and connecting with the world. We have more questions and comments coming in. And we have just a few more minutes left with you. Thank you for spending the morning with us because we know you had to get up early to make sure you're, we do the, uh, the field test with you. And then you stayed and watched the whole thing, which was very, very kind. 
Uh, Stefan, who's on our team, he says, our son is so worried that he may not be able to finish grade school in school. This is so difficult on our children. They need the socialization and time together. But with another possible outbreak in the fall, the chances of being in school seems slim. Corey Dean said that there is a chance, uh, and she thinks that all schools should think about what is right for them. What do you say? Sure. So first of all, Stefan, I, I would say that I share your pain. I'm a mom of a beautiful eight-year-old daughter. We've been experiencing the, the same thing. Um, look, it's tough. You know, you, me, we're, we're all again in the same boat and, and none of us want to see our children get harmed or bring something home to other folks in the family. So I would say that we need to remember this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's time to get creative. Um, you know, kids are resilient. I, I would tell you that just watching my daughter, they're actually doing a lot better than, than I think a lot of us realize because I will tell you for my daughter personally, you know, she's FaceTiming more than ever. She never had a, had a phone before. Now she has my iPad. I, I feel like she's an early teenager um, calling all her friends all the time and, and I'm supportive. I'm like, okay, this is better than TV. Um, we've got to get creative. You know, there's, um, Again, I think this is going to be a personal decision for families as well as, uh, you know, depending on your region and what the schools decide to do. But I, I would come up with that personal, I call it the doctor mom checklist, which is one, what is the situation in your region? Are cases going up? Are they going down? Um, any individual situations in your with your family's health, either with your child potentially having asthma in particular or any underlying lung issues, anyone else in the family that they could potentially bring something home to that is a vulnerable member of the family. Do you have health insurance? Do you have a good savings? God forbid something were to happen. Could you take care of your child and your family? Um, and, and, you know, weighing the risks of how do you get creative, um, seeing what you can do in Zoom versus a lot of the things that Cornelia talked about, that, that in-person tangibility and how important do you feel that is. Um, and then, you know, just being in touch with your school and feeling really confident that the teachers are taking it seriously, they have good infection control, and also just being ready to pivot because schools might open and then they might find that they can't. Remember, we have flu season coming up in the fall. So there's a lot of moving parts here. And unfortunately, you know, I certainly don't pretend to have the answers. I, I think folks that do are uh, perhaps speaking out of turn. We're going to have to just see how that put this plays out. But please do come up with your own individual checklist. And, you know, you hope for the best, but you have to plan for the worst. That is great advice. And you're uh, absolutely right that people don't know what what is exactly um, what, what's going to happen. Uh, by the way, we've just put on the screen our uh, some of the things that we're doing on our other shows. This was a show we just did about talking to a seven-year-old and uh, Neil and his wonderful daughter, Emily Margaret Parikh, uh, did an incredible show with us on Friday where we got a seven-year-old's view of COVID-19. And uh, you were right, Doc, she was much more optimistic than uh, many of us would have thought a seven-year-old could be. We also showed you an ad for our program of what we're doing, folks. Uh, if you are interested in uh, anything like this, having your own web show, if you have an in-person event you're going to cancel, let us help you. Don't cancel it. Call us before you cancel it. My email address is three at three net. We're doing an event for 50,000 teachers next Saturday, uh, an entire day, con day long conference. If you have teacher friends, tell them to go to T4, the letter T, the number four dot education. We're doing that show. We just did finish a conference for Princeton University, three day conference that at 75 universities participating. We can do an event no matter how small or how big we can work with you. So just email me three at three dot net. We're very grateful to our production team that makes all of this possible. And please go to my YouTube channel and become a subscriber, youtube.com slash 3net, so you can see all our shows uh, that we've been doing, including the archives of this show, which have been so great. And thank you so much to Dr. Nair for being with us. Let's see if we have a couple more questions, and then I have some questions for you before we let you go. So uh, let me ask you, uh, Doc, in terms of your own signs that you're looking for, for your own daughter, how will you know that things are okay or where things are going? Sure. So, you know, again, that the list that I went through, again, you, you know, kind of assessing our own home situation, our own health situation, our own access to, um, 
care if we need to with our own doctor, virtual or in-person testing. And, and again, really good relationship with the school and the teacher and understanding what their mitigation plan is, independent of what I think as a parent and a doc, right? So I, I think you just got to go through that personal list. And, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, the, there's also this X factor of just are you comfortable or are you not? And, and I think it's okay. And that first question before you leave your house is, is it worth it? Right. So you've got to, I think you got to stop kind of dig deep, come up with that list and figure out the ways you can get creative. We're, we're definitely doing a lot of virtual learning. Um, I've come up with our own summer camp uh, regimen for, for the summer. We're blessed to be in South Florida where there's a lot of sun and, um, a lot of outdoor activities. And, you know, I think also having a good circle with other families. So, you know, we have done a few play dates on the driveway. We do six feet apart, the kids, right? They do the the sidewalk chalk. Um, a lot of things we grew up with have come back and, and they enjoy it, right? It, it doesn't have to be the social distance. It just has to be the physical distance. That's that's the key. Sujana Chandrasekhar, Dr. Sujana is a wonderful friend of the show. She's been on, I think all my shows so far. And she says lots of teens and young adults are assuming they don't need to wear masks if they're hanging out and keeping six feet from each other or going on a bike ride together. What's your advice? You know, a, a mask is better than no mask. That that would really universally be my advice. And and namely because, yes, if you're more than six feet apart, that's, that's likely the safest distance and you're going to be okay. But what happens when you're biking is the whole time you may not be six feet away, right? And we're all human. It's human nature. It's, it's hard to know exactly what is six feet and, oh, you know, we're around that corner. It's three feet. So I think you got to plan for reality. And when you have the mask on, it just takes that, that element away and you can safely feel that you are in in fact protected and that's very helpful to to have that information i'm looking at a tweet by scott gottlieb md he is the former commissioner of the uh of the cdc and uh, what he is saying is that new hospitalizations are uh, nationwide have risen slightly over the last week after showing sustained declines over the two preceding weeks this view looks at nation outside of new york state tri-state region. That's what he just tweeted, Scott Gottlieb, MD. What do you say that is a sign of the fact that it's going up? Is that because of the reopening? So again, we got to watch the, the numbers, right? And, and Scott and I know each other and it's, it's very- Sorry, can I just, sorry, my fault. I said he was the commissioner of the CDC. He was the commissioner of the <laughs> FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration, and uh, obviously under President Trump. That's right. So, so again, Scott's right. We we have to watch the numbers. It's too early. The the bottom line is it's too early. I, you know, I will tell you in South Florida in particular, and it's not just about domestic. We remember we're all in this together, and and we're around the globe feeling this. I will tell you what is also significant for us here in South Florida is the numbers rising in Brazil. There is a big concern that Latin America, which we are very connected to here in South Florida, a lot of these cases coming to us. So I would say that it's not even just about domestic numbers. We've got to really watch the whole situation um, because, as we know, this what goes around comes around, and so we've got to be very smart. And yes, the the numbers do not lie. Thank you. That's something that we all need to be paying attention to. I am so scared watching all the ways in which this has been reopening so fast. Uh, nothing I'd love more than to get out and do more with my family outside, but we have to be careful, especially Memorial Day weekend. For our international audience, we should put this in perspective, Doc, that this is the traditional start of summer, and basically no work gets done in America uh, typically between, say, Thursday afternoon and Tuesday. And the fact that I could even get you to join us today and Corey Dean and all of this just tells you we had a meeting Friday evening, which would never have been possible in the non-Zoom days and the non-COVID days. We have meetings on Monday, kind of chock-a-block, uh, Neil and I and others, for our virtual events business. And so that tells you the world we're in now. Mark Lee says, before COVID, a friend of mine was a major advocate for better health care for our veterans. As we go into Memorial Day, do you think this is still an issue? I'm wondering if the issue hasn't been overshadowed by COVID. And yes, we aren't uh, saying enough thanks to on Memorial Day for all those who perished uh, defending this country. You know, I think that's a terrific point and a different and a, and a terrific question, right? When when I looked actually at that list on the front cover of the New York Times, it was very rep reminiscent of a war memorial. Um, and, and I think that we have to keep that in mind. Our veterans need better health care. 
we need better health care. You and I need better health care. I fundamentally believe we're all patients. We've all been sick at some point in our life, or we've all been in the position where we've had to take care of a loved one who's sick. And this just couldn't be a more humbler time for us to remember that we're all human. And those that are making the sacrifice, our veterans, the frontline workers, the folks manning the grocery store. I mean, you all know this. We we have to take care of one another. And one of the things that I hope, one of the positive things that come out of this is a investment, a true investment in healthcare infrastructure, the workforce, we have a major shortage of doctors, nurses, specialists, myself as a rheumatologist, there's a global, there's a global shortage of rheumatologists. And this disease actually falls squarely into our specialty, Kawasaki disease, hydroxychloroquine, medications I give routinely for lupus patients. We've never had enough rheumatologists in this country and, and now we will have even fewer. So these are all things we are gonna have to assess very similar to wartime where we need to say, how do we bolster our infrastructure for our veterans as well as the general population? Because this is going to be something we never forget. And the question is, how do we make sure it never happens again? But I don't think our country is ready for that, uh, especially with everything that's going on. Thank you for making the point about rheumatologists and the kind of need you have for that drug that does work in your field for your patients doesn't mean everybody should be having it and people are dying because the president and others are pointing that out. Let, tell us about this photograph. Oh, sure. So, you know, so I'm currently working the COVID-19 hotline at the University of Miami where I practice. And again, very humbling experience, largely manned by volunteers, medical students, uh, physicians such as myself. And we really are getting those questions. We're getting those questions from the general population. I got a test. I haven't gotten the result. What do I do? I now have a cough, a fever. I actually had someone call in that I had to send directly to the emergency room that was a nurse and said, I'm waiting for my test. I don't know what to do. And, you know, in, in talking with her, I said, I think we both know what needs to happen here. You, you've got to go to the emergency room and you got to go right now. So, you know, this is very much hitting close to home uh, for me, Shri, personally. My, I've come from a family of physicians. My mom's a doc. My father's an ICU doc. Um, so we, we're all just as humble. The, the medical community is clearly just as humbled, just as burned out and looking for the same answers as everyone and really just doing our best. This is coming down to doing our best, taking measured risks and asking that same question before we leave the house. Is it worth it? And, you know, hats off again to the frontline workers for saying it is worth it. You know, it, it is worth it. It's not about a paycheck necessarily. It's about doing this for the community and because this is the mission that we went into this field for. So, and I, and again, I really appreciate your, your program and bringing docs on. I, I think it's not just about covering science. It's how do you get people to translate it? How do you get ambassadors of scientific, scientific information to actually explain it? Because people are hungry for the answers and where we have them, we need to be very transparent and where we don't, we need to say, we're still figuring it out. Absolutely. And thank you for being such a great ambassador. And thank you for your time. We want to get you back to your family on a Sunday morning on Memorial Day. Uh, tell us what you'll be doing today and tomorrow. Oh, gosh, it's it's uh, zooming all day long. I'll be calling my, my folks, checking on them and um, doing some some fun. Uh, me and my daughter play virtual battleship a lot. She's really good at it. I, I used to play the old ones and, you know, movies and, and we'll likely do our daily run and our, our daily walk outside. That's that's all the excitement for today here in Miami. And where are your folks these days? So my parents live in the Stewart area, about two hours uh, north. And again, just just hardcore docs. My dad's an ICU physician, asked him to stay home. And he said, you know, I, I can't do that. And, and so it's, it's, again, really humbling times, very humbling times for all of us. So I have an idea for a future show on my daily program. I'd love to have all three of you on the show with us. We'll have a family conversation. Instead of doing it by Zoom, we'll do it in front of the entire world. What do you say? Oh, that'd be wonderful. If I can get them to figure out how to get on, that would be wonderful. I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. I'll, we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, you, you needed some tech help today, as we all do to do this, right? That's right. That's right. We, we, we hope for the best. We plan for the worst. <laughs> yeah, uh, in every single way. Thank you so much. Dr. Gita Nair is available at GitaNair.com. And check out her Twitter handle, her Instagram. All of it is linked off Gita Nair. She's also on LinkedIn, and she's a chief medical officer of Greenway. She joined us uh, from Miami, uh, where the weather isn't as good as it could be, but Miami is always a wonderful place to visit. And we would have been down there already. This uh, two trips of mine to Miami have been canceled 
this spring. So that tells you something. Geeta Nair, MD, MBA, IG, Dr. Dr. G Nair, Twitter, at G Nair, and Facebook, Dr. Geeta Nair, and, and LinkedIn, and of course, all of it under GeetaNair.com. Thank you very much, Doc. Thanks so much, Sri. Take care. All right. Uh, thank you. And with that, folks, uh, we're at 1039. Uh, we want to tell you about tonight's show. It's episode number, actually, it's episode 74. So that's my typo. There's so many episodes, we're losing track. But uh, Patrice Tanaka, Chief Joy Officer of JoyfulPlanet.com, will be my guest tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. Please, please, please tell your friends to join us. Uh, we would love to have you there as we talk about positivity on Sunday night. And then we go back and look at our entire archives, SreeNet on YouTube, S-R-E-E-N-E-T. Please email us with questions and comments about any of our activities, our newsletter, our Facebook group. If you're not part of any of those things, please email me. We'll add you to them. And a big thank you to our producers who are rock stars, Neil Parik, executive producer, Paulus Kiger, who is one of our producers, Steve uh, Taylor, another wonderful producer, Julia Weeks, a great producer, and also helping us this week and so many weeks with our guests, Carla Baranakis, a former copy chief of the New York Times. Uh, whenever we end our shows, we remind people that you can rewind and watch the entire thing. If you joined us late, Corey Dean, former editor, uh, science editor of the New York Times was our guest. She was fabulous. She has a great book out uh, called Making Sense of Science. And Gita Nair, Chief Medical Officer of Greenway, was with us as well. And look at me, how well-dressed I am. I'm wearing a T-shirt today. I don't think I've, I've always worn shorts as I'm doing these shows now. One day, I hope to wear pants instead of shorts. And next week, you will not want to miss this. Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist and author of 40 books, only mostly on economics, will be joining us. He has things to say on politics, on COVID-19, on everything happening in the world. Please join us for Joe Stiglitz next Sunday, 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We've been doing the show for 10, sorry, for five years, and we're so grateful. Jonathan Borstein, great show. Dean was fantastic. Thank you. We'll see you guys tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, next Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, and every day this week, we have multiple exciting shows, including our 75th anniversary show, not anniversary, but I got to come up with a word, 75th episode is this week on Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll uh, bring you all together. Thank you very much. Epic read-along. Bye. Thanks, Stefan. <laughs>